When I was a teenager, I remember hearing a pastor say very ominously that Jesus talked much more about hell than he did about heaven. But that is patently false. Jesus actually didn't talk that much about either, though he did talk about them. And we're going to talk about them today. Welcome back to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to reignite the faith of the fathers. I wanted to talk today about the judgment to come. That is something, if you saw it on a church marquee, if you're honest, you probably would feel a little bit annoyed. It's a rather obnoxious subject. You'd expect to be kind of berated with uh, pictures of doom and gloom in the future and possible torment and have this really kind of fearful message and hopefully scare you into the kingdom of God. That's kind of the goal of those things usually. But I want to say today that the judgment to come is something that I eagerly anticipate. It's something I'm excited for. It's something that I want. Uh, Because judgment is not the same thing as condemnation. That is a very important point. The Bible talks a whole lot more about judgment than it does about hell. Jesus said that Uh, Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's almost the extent to which Jesus talked about hell. Uh, It's not, he he did talk about it more than that, but not that much. The the story of the Bible is not a story about um, God creating a world that goes bad and then he's trying to salvage our souls for an eternity called heaven or an eternity called hell if we don't don't, uh, pray the prayer of salvation or something like that. The story of the Bible is about God creating a good world, that world becoming infested with evil, um, and God, in the first place, commissioning the human race to rule over that world, but they failed to do so, so he sends Jesus to reestablish God's rule and reign over the earth, and then through the Holy Spirit to reestablish human beings as his um, co-reigners, the people who reign with him. Uh, When we suffer with him, Paul says, we also reign with him. Um, And so... We are um, in a story where, uh, of redemption. God is redeeming planet Earth. And for that reason, the judgment to come is something we can anticipate with excitement. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 9, 8, He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. I have seven kids, and so um, I am the judge many times. My wife and I are the judges in our home when there is a dispute among the children. If one is treating the other unjustly, the one who is treated unjustly will come to us, make their complaint, their petition, and they are glad when the judge arrives to set things right. That is what the judgment to come is about. Um, in Revelation, uh, Revelation eleven eighteen, it says that the nations were enraged and your wrath came, the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward the, your bond servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who, des- who destroy the earth. This is what we're looking forward to, the day when God destroys those who destroy the earth. He's going to wipe away every tear from our face, and he's going to wipe away every mechanism for causing those tears in the first place. This is good news. Jesus has come. The judge has come. If what you want is righteousness, peace, and joy, then this is something to celebrate, not something to dread. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 2, 15 through 16, he said, their conscience, speaking of human beings, their conscience on the final day, um, or speaking of the final day, he says, their conscience bears witness as well, and their thoughts will run this way and that, sometimes accusing them and sometimes excusing on the day when, according to the gospel I proclaim, God judges all secrets through King Jesus. So, uh, Jesus doesn't talk that much about hell. Uh, But that doesn't mean uh, that—I think many times we have far too concrete a notion as far as uh, what hell is or how it works. Um, You know, uh, if you didn't say the sinner's prayer when you die, you go straight to hell or you go straight to heaven. I believe we stand before God in his presence and he will judge us justly. There is— there are a lot of scriptures that say that he, we are going to be judged according to our deeds, whether good or evil, and I never hear any pastor talk about that because Protestantism has not had any real space to understand how to appropriate that. And um, so we just don't talk about those verses because they seem to contradict uh, the central message, which is grace 
through faith uh, of Protestantism. But uh, Protestantism, I think, is, the I believe, in the Reformation, it was a great thing. It, it re- restored a lot of truths that had got muddled up in the Catholic Church, uh, but it doesn't have all the answers. I believe the Reformers also needed reforming, as every human being does. We are in a process of being set free, being liberated, and we must continue to submit to the truth. And I believe that there are some places in Protestant Protestantism that lacks full truth. Um, and not uh, ignoring these scriptures about judgment uh, and how how it's going to work according to our deeds, whether good or evil, is one of those areas that Protestantism has failed in. Uh, so by that, I don't believe that the scriptures are teaching that our good is going to be weighed against our bad. That is completely not what the scriptures teach. What it, what Paul is saying when he um, talks about being judged according to our deeds, whether good and evil, as many of us Christians, not least, uh, like to believe that we are better than we really are. Because for many Christians, we've, we've come to Christ, we've repented, we've been born again, we know we were radically changed, uh, that we used to live a life of sin that we got redeemed of, we've got forgiven from, um, and now now we want to live for Jesus. Uh, so when we still have sin, we have almost a harder time admitting it because uh, we forget the gospel, that we, we forget that we were saved while we were still sinners. And somehow, it seems this seems very natural, very common among in religious circles, that we begin to believe that we were somehow saved because we were better than other people. Uh, and that is just absolutely false. Christians and non-Christians will be judged on Judgment Day, according to their deeds, whether good or evil, and that means that the person you really are will be judged, rather than the person you portray yourself as. Facebook is a perfect example of what we all do as humans. We put our best face forward. We post things that we think, that we want to represent who we are, but we all know that the real person is not seen on Facebook, but in the presence of God, the real person is seen and the person is judged according to who they really are rather than who they portrayed themselves to be. So the day of the coming day of judgment is going to be a day of a lot of surprises. It's also going to be a day of, um, yeah, it's going to be surprises both in the negative and in the positive. Um, but if you are someone who wants the truth uh, and you know how to plead in the throne room of God, then you have nothing to be afraid of. And that's that's the key. And I know I've talked about this a lot when it comes to deliverance ministry uh, and helping Christians get free, um, including myself. There are many times we can get stuck in condemnation uh, because we are afraid of admitting that we have sin because we're not, we know as Christians we're not supposed to be sinning. So we're kind of ashamed of that, and we're afraid that we'll be rejected if we admit that we have sin. But of course, uh, whether we admit it or not, God already knows it, and the, the God is a judge, and we'll be judged for it. So the, the thing to do is not to hide it or pretend you'd, you aren't guilty, but to bring it into the light and to plead the blood of Jesus. Pleading is a courtroom legal term. And the Bible describes Jesus as our advocate or our defense attorney. And his blood is our winning argument that when we uh, plead his blood over our sin, we are acquitted. That is basic. It's fundamental to Christianity. And many Christians believe that in their heads. But we have a hard time believing it when it comes to actually practicing it. We oftentimes don't admit our sin because... Um, we don't believe that we'll be accepted. We believe we'll be rejected if we admit our sin. And part of that comes from the angry God portrayal that many um, religious people have portrayed uh, or have projected to us, and that's just unfortunate. But the truth is God loves us even while we are still sinners, and so um, he, he also knows everything, so he already knows our sin, and we need to bring it into the light and uh, instead of arguing and saying I wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't really a lie, or um, it wasn't as bad as it sounds, just admit your guilt and then plead the blood of Jesus. If you know how to do that, if you make a habit of doing that, you have nothing to fear on Judgment Day. The Apostle Paul spoke to um, Felix the governor, the Roman governor, um, and it says that uh, in the Book of Acts, he says he talked about. 
justice, self-control, and the judgment to come, and Felix became afraid. Uh, and th- so the judgment to come does give reasons for fear if we are not cooperating with the Holy Spirit. But uh, but like I said, it's wrong to think of the judgment to come as the condemnation to come. It might be condemnation, as Paul says, um, we will... Our thoughts will sometimes accuse us on that day and sometimes excuse us uh, because there is one thing that uh, we all lack, and that is a full revelation of the love of our Father in heaven. If we have a full revelation of the love of our Father in heaven, uh, we will walk in liberty because um, perfect love casts out all fear, and there's no fear in love. And it's only when we don't want love that we end up under condemnation. Um Hebrews uh, 10, 26 through 27 says, If we sin deliberately and knowingly, after having received the knowledge of the truth, there is no further sacrifice for sin. Instead, there is a fearful prospect of judgment and a hungry fire which will consume the opponents. Hebrews 10, 26 through 27. And this scripture single-handedly demolishes the notions, the notion of once saved, always saved, along with Jesus' very profound statement that unless you forgive those who have sinned against you, you cannot be forgiven. This applies to Christians and non-Christians alike. Jesus said, if you do not forgive those who sin against you, you cannot be forgiven. Uh, And so if you are not forgiven, who pays for your wrongdoings? You do. So the the notion of once saved, always saved uh, is not is not something the Bible teaches, and I know that that will offend a gazillion people, and that's fine. The the um, doctrine exists because people want assurance about their salvation, but it doesn't actually work to assure people of their salvation because the people who defend it most are obviously not secure about it. That's why they argue for it so severely. But like I said, it doesn't mean that we need to be uh, afraid of Judgment Day because even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more, uh, now that we are his friends, will his blood apply to us? But it says here, those who sin deliberately and knowingly, and that's key. Uh, This is not saying that if you are struggling with sin as a Christian, that you're in a perilous place. This is saying if you are in rebellion, you are in a perilous place, uh, because rebellion um, will not be tolerated. Uh, That's something that, uh, you know, all sin is rebellion, but there is uh, a certain kind of rebellion that is more willful than others, more knowledgeable of what it's doing than others. And this isn't saying either that it's impossible for them to be uh, to be restored. It's just saying there's there's nothing if if you are choosing sin, knowing it's sin, there's nothing left for you except to. Uh, you know what? Then you're not going to get a new revelation. You already know it's sin, and you're choosing it. All that's left for you is destruction, and that is because, um, like Jesus said, hell was made for the devil and his angels. And if you are a host for a demon, uh, if a demon is has made you his house, and you know he's there, and you refuse to evict him. Um, then you're going to have to be destroyed with the demon because you are a house for a demon and nothing in God's new creation is going to deface it. So God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. If you are housing a demon and demons do nothing except steal, kill, and destroy, you will be destroyed with the demon because there's no other option when, as God is remaking the world into a place of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You cannot cooperate with the devil and expect to survive the coming age. This is good news for those of us who want to live in peace because God's not going to tolerate evil. It's it's, uh, sobering news if you are colluding with evil in the present. So, you know, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. I say, give me deliverance or give me death. It's the same thing, but we think of that word differently. Give me deliverance or give me death. Because whether or not we call ourselves Christians, whether or not we have that label, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the good news for the believer is that we get to have deliverance right now in the present. But if you call yourself a Christian and you don't actually want deliverance from your sin now, what makes you think 
you're going to want it on the final day. Uh, the, the, the good news of the gospel is that the future of God's world, where every tear is wiped away and evil is dealt with, has come forward to us in the present, that Jesus has already been raised from the dead, and the Holy Spirit has already been given, and all authority in heaven and earth has already been granted to Jesus. Therefore, victory over sin, death, and the grave has already come forward to meet us in the present. So if you call yourself a Christian, then the inheritance that you have you know, it is your birthright to wake up to to uh, righteousness, peace, and joy. It's your birthright to wake up with hope. It's your birthright to wake up with joy and with peace, with confidence in the future. It is not your inheritance to wake up with depression, to wake up with anger, to wake up with addiction. If those things are in your life, then there's a lie there that needs to be dealt with. And the blood of Jesus, which has already been shed, can set you free right now. The future for God's world, the judgment to come that we're waiting, is a world made of righteousness, peace, and joy. All the earth flooded with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As the prophet Habakkuk said in Revelation, it talks in Revelation uh, 21 and 22, it talks about the uh, heaven coming down to earth, earth and heaven becoming one. It doesn't talk about uh, pulling our souls up in a great rapture into heaven. It talks about heaven coming down to earth and earth and heaven becoming one. This is the future, the heaven flooding earth, as Habakkuk said, like the waters covering the sea, that God's glory will consume earth as uh, affirming his good creation, affirming his calling for us to be... uh, co-regents with him, to reign with him. He will confirm that. He's already doing it. He's Christ is reigning in me as I cast out demons, as I heal the sick, as I proclaim the gospel, and as I submit to him myself, I have already begun to share the reign of Christ right here, right now, in the present. Uh, we are at the cutting edge of God's future, and that's that's the exciting thing about being a Christian. But if you call yourself a Christian and yet you don't want deliverance, you'd want to hang on to that sin, uh, you don't want to humble yourself, what makes you think you're going to change on that final day? This is what the warning in Hebrews is about, that those who knowingly and deliberately sin after coming to the knowledge of the truth, there's nothing for you except the prospect, the fearful prospect of judgment and a hungry fire which will consume the opponents because God has this fire of hell prepared for the devil and his angels for all the garbage that infests God's good creation. He's going to burn it up. It's the purifying rubbish uh, rubbish pile that he's burning up, and that's good news, but you don't want to be part of that. Um, but if you knowingly, willingly choose evil after knowing the truth, that's all that you can expect. This scripture, I think, has been um, overly scary in some ways because of the way the gospel is often represented, that people say, um, you know, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, we say, well, you heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That is, of course, 100% truth, and and it's extremely important, but it's not all truth. There are ramifications. There, There's the effect of what Jesus did on the cross that matters, that is, uh, produces truth. Like, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins is what reveals the second fact that God loves us, and God's love for us is uh, an important truth that needs to be impl- uh, applied to all factions of our life. There's many. There are many Christians who have believed Uh, that they are sinners, that Christ died for them. They've accepted that much, but there are other areas of their life where they don't really understand God's love for them. And so, uh, you know, you may be saying, well, I'm struggling with sin, but, uh, you know, should I be afraid of hell? And that's not what I'm saying at all. If you're struggling with sin and you want to be free, then what you need is a deeper revelation of the knowledge of the love of your Father in heaven. You need a deeper revelation of truth on the day of judgment, this is why you don't have to be afraid, on the day of judgment, you will be standing in the presence of 100% unadulterated truth, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free if that's what you really want. But if that is what you really want, that truth, that freedom is ready for you in the present. It may take a process of of getting to it. It may, uh, you know, you... It, well, a lot of times we're layered people and we have these, um, you know, different layers of hurt. And sometimes the top one has to be removed before the one 
three layers down can be dealt with that's causing maybe an addiction or something like that. But we, uh, you know, God loves us in the process. That's why he died for us while we are still sinners. We don't have to be afraid that God is going to condemn us or God is going to reject us while we are struggling with sin. It is his love for us while we are still sinners that should give us the courage to come into his presence and receive the inheritance of freedom right here and right now. So this is the good news, that if you are struggling with sin, you can be set free right now because in the judgment to come, you will be set free from that. If you're like, nah, I'm okay, I'm good for now. If God's going to deal with it when I die, then I'll just live with it for now. And uh, because, you know, I like my life well enough and um, he's going to take care of it then. If that's your hard attitude, you're not going to change your mind on Judgment Day either. Because I'm telling you right now, you can be set free from that sin. And if you don't want to be set free from it now, you won't want to be set free from it later unless you have a change of heart, which is what we call repentance. But if you want to be set free right now, you can be set free uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through repentance. I pray, as 2 Peter 3, 2 says, for the hastening of the coming of the Lord, not because I want a rapture or anything like that. I want it to come because I want justice to reign. I want holiness to reign. I want to live in a world of righteousness, peace, and joy. And I pray that you do too. So if you are dealing right now with pornography addiction, if you are dealing right now with um, committing adultery, if you are dealing right now with anger and rage um, and all these things that are not um, causing the fruit of the Holy Spirit to to be born in your life, I want to pray with you right now. Whatever it is that you're repenting of, uh, whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, I want you to um, renounce it. And for some of you, it's really important to know too, like if you're struggling with pornography, Many times, pornography is um, the, uh, it, it's the, uh, the flower sounds like a nice word for it because it's not, it's not a nice thing, but it's still, it's like the fruit of a poisonous vine, but it's the root of that vine that is the real problem. The pornography is a problem, but the root, whatever that root is, is the real problem. And for a lot of people, uh, struggles with pornography, that may be inherited because your father dealt with that. Your father committed adul- adultery, um, or maybe your grandfather, uh, you know, or maybe you were molested or abused as a child. Maybe you're, you were rejected by your mom. You have mom issues that, um, for a lot of men, uh, they did not feel loved and accepted by their mother. There are some um, serious rejection issues there. And when they turn to pornography, part of it is that this woman is uh, in the in the porn is making them feel for a tempor- temporarily like they are somebody, like they're loved, that they're nurtured, that they're cared for, that they're wanted, that they're sought after. That's part of the appeal of pornography, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know I say pornography is a problem, absolutely, but the root of that problem may be something like rejection. Um, so uh, we're we're gonna just do a shotgun prayer here for. Um, for people, and I believe you're going to be set free. But it may also be that there are some deeper issues, and if you need to um, go into those issues, which, I mean, who doesn't? Uh, be f- be free to leave a comment, um, and we can get in touch. Or you can also reach out on the website, carlgessler.com, and we can set up a session uh, for you to be set free, because this is so important. Um, if we're ever going to live in a country uh, that has justice, in it again, we must be just ourselves. If we want to live in a world where we can go to court and know that the judge is going to do what's right, we have to be willing to be set right first. And that is what we are working on right now. So um, whatever it is that God is bringing up into your mind, if you are angry at your father, angry at your mother, I want you right now to say to God why you're angry at them and then say, you know, I'm angry at my mom because she rejected me, because she didn't listen to me, because she abused me, because she neglected me, because she abandoned me, whatever it is. And then say, Lord, I forgive and I bless my mom. I forgive and I bless my dad. You know, I have anger at my dad because he he objectified women. He, um, he set a bad example. Uh, he wasn't there for me. He abandoned our family. Um, he screamed at me. Whatever, whatever it was, he hit me. Um, you need to name it. 
and then say, Lord, I forgive and I bless my father. I forgive and I bless my mother. I forgive and I bless my um, ex-girlfriend. I forgive and I bless my ex-boyfriend. Wh- whoever it is, whoever you need to forgive, just forgive them right now. Um, and whatever sin you're struggling with, nicotine addiction, uh, drug addiction, a porn- pornography addiction, an, an addiction to rage, an addiction to alcohol, an addiction to food, whatever you're leaning on to try to fill that void, uh, you need to renounce it right now because that is your prisoner. That's who is holding you hostage, and Jesus is going to set you free. So, Lord, right now, we bring our sins to you, Lord. We bring our rage. We bring our selfishness. We bring our addiction. Uh, Lord, we bring our pride. We bring, Lord, the um, the horrible things we've said to others in arguments. Lord, we just come to you today humbly, and we ask, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your blood that you bore on the cross uh, the, all the all the weight of my sin. Lord, the, the curses that I brought on myself, you bore them. The Bible says that you uh, were hung on a tree, and cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So you became a curse for me, so that the curses that were brought on me by my ancestors and the curses that were brought on me by my own behaviors, Lord, were laid on you. So I want to thank you for that, and I want to take advantage of that. Just like the the blood of the lamb was put, put over the doorway so that the death angel would pass by and the Israelites would be protected, today, Lord, we are placing the blood of Jesus over the doorway of our homes. We don't want to be burned up with the chaff. We don't want to be burned up with the demons. We want the demons cast out. We want them driven into the sea. We want them swallowed up in your wrath we want to be swallowed up in your love. So, Lord, we repent of um, going to idols. Lord, we repent of leaning on vaping. We repent on leaning on pornography, Lord, to try to heal the wounds, to try to satisfy the soul, Lord God. All these things were wrong. We, we have all that we need in you. You are our Father, and your love for us is immeasurable. For, so forgive us for leaning on these things that have caused further hurt in our families and has caused physical damage to our bodies and physical damage and emotional damage and spiritual damage to our minds and our souls. Lord, we repent of these things right now. Lord, forgive us for being part of the problem. Forgive us for while we complain about the injustice in the world that we have been unjust in our own homes. We've been unjust in our own relationships. We've been unjust in our marriages, God. We've been unjust in our parenting, and we repent of these things, Lord, and we don't want to uh, be destroyed with them. We want you to destroy them. And for some of you, you have things in your home. You have movies, you have magazines, you have books, you have uh, music, you have jewelry. They, they are ungodly. Some of them are tied to the occult. Some of them are pornographic in nature, and you need to burn them right now. That is the future for those things. They will be burned. You need to burn them right now. Burn them out of your life so that you are not burned with them. Already experience the judgment to come. Be part of God's judgment to come by participating in it. You pick up those things, throw them in the trash, or throw them in the burn pile, and let them experience the judgment that was promised to them, that is coming to them. This is something you can see that judgment to come. Come forward into the present as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit and get rid of these things. Uh, You're going to be liberated as you do that. So, Lord, we just continue to repent of uh, just all the wickedness, Lord, all all of the lies that we have spoken, trying to get ourselves an advantage, trying to be somebody, trying to make people think that we're somebody, Lord. We, we have participated in vanity, self-promotion. Lord, forgive us for all of these things, Lord. We know that you know our hearts. Lord, we've presented to other people um, a, a face of someone who is always good, always kind, always friendly, always generous, but in truth, we have been vindictive. In truth, we have been vain. In truth, we have been selfish. In truth, we have been stingy. In truth, we have been dishonest, presenting ourselves as being more generous than we really are. Lord, forgive us for these things. We know that you already know these things. And so, Lord, we just bring them into the light. We enter the courtroom of heaven, and we want to live in the truth of what really is rather than what we, <clears throat> in our foolishness, are presenting to the world. So, Lord, we forgive. Uh, we ask for your forgiveness for that. We bring these things under the blood of Jesus, and we want to be set free today. Lord, we just confess lying to you. Yeah, so in the name of Jesus, I just speak 
to every spirit of vanity and pride, every spirit of lying that has been trying to um, hide the real person. Lord, we just we acknowledge that uh, the day is coming when you will judge us according to our deeds, whether good or evil, that all these things that we have been confessing to you will be fully known, and nobody will be able to lie about it. Nobody will be able to uh, cover it over. It'll be known for what it really is. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your light that's already shining on it. And then in the name of Jesus, I command every spirit that's attached to these unclean things, every unclean spirit with an unclean appetite, every spirit of lust, I command you to leave right now. I command you to come all the way up and all the way out right now. I command every spirit of depression, every spirit of heaviness, every spirit of suicide, I command you to go right now. Go back to the pit and do not return. Leave this person. They are not your house. They are not your property. You go to your judgment and leave this person alone right now. Yeah, I command every spirit of suicide out right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Every spirit of pride and vanity, I cast you out right now. Go to the pit. You don't belong in the children of God. Go right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I cancel the assignments of disease, sickness, death, and divorce. I command you out right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Leave right now in the mighty name of Jesus. You will not have this marriage. You will not have this person. You will not destroy. You will not deceive. In the name of Jesus, I command every spirit of divorce and destruction out right now in the mighty name of Jesus. If you are experiencing anything like tingling, uh, burning sensations, or sweating, or feeling sick to your stomach, these are manifestations of demons leaving your body. So they're good things. If that's happening to you, you know, leave a leave a comment. Let me know what's going on. And just let me know where it hit the mark for you today. But even if you don't, I know that the Holy Spirit is moving right now in your life. So Lord, I just thank you for everyone who's listening. I thank you that their heart is turning toward you. Put your finger, Holy Spirit, right now on whatever uh, whatever this person is dealing with. And Lord, what the roots are. Tell them what they need to repent of, Lord. And I just thank you that you are setting us free right now. Lord, forgive us for religious attitudes that we thought we were better than other people because we went to this church or we spoke in tongues or we've never done that sin. Lord, forgive us for that. Set us free from that pride. Lord God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I ask that you'd fill every person listening right now with the Holy Spirit, that you would drive out the darkness and that you'd fill each person listening today, each person watching today with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. Lord, I just thank you that your love for us is perfect. I thank th- thank you that you are truth and in you there is no darkness at all. In him there is life and in him there is light and in him there is no darkness at all at all. Lord, I thank you. So we come into you in whom there is no darkness, and we say, judge of all things, set us free right now from every lie, from every corruption, from every evil, and fill us with the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.